one paper deals with uh, the transmission of volatility among uh, developed markets and emerging markets and the second one deals with crypto as a asset class and how that can be used in the portfolio management and the third one is uh, talking about you know the uh, how like capital growth happens in the uh, family based farm these are the other kind of professional farms so i think all these three papers are quite contextual as i narrated in my initial remarks uh, now i will request uh, people to please call upon your uh, presenters to make their presentation Thank you. So, before losing any time, uh, I'm going to call upon the first paper. The first paper is going to be presented in webinar mode, and the title is Integration between Emerging Market Equity and Global Markets Is It Fundamental or Noisy? Evidence from Wavelet, Wavelet Denoise Volatility Spillover Analysis. In time and frequency domain. The authors are Sangram Jaina from International Management Institute, Bhubaneswar, Abhiran Kumar Tiwari, Rajkri School, Emmanuel Joel Atkinson, University of Adelaide Business School, and David Robert, Montpellier Business School. Uh, with the permission of Chair, I request presenters of first paper to proceed with their presentation. Over to you, Weber. Yeah, uh, he is facing some issue right now. Mr. Sangram is facing some issues right now. We are sorting out. Okay. If there is a problem, you can call the next presenter. He can come in later. Uh, there is some technical issue with the first presenter. So we are going to first start with the second presentation. Uh, the second paper is also going to be presented in webinar mode. Uh, and the title is A Multi Country Comparison of Cryptocurrency versus Gold Portfolio Optimization to Generalized Simulating MLA. The authors are Mr. Parthaji Kayal and Askit So from Madras School of Economics. With the permission of Chair, I request presenters of second paper to proceed with their presentations. Over to you, Vero. Is it okay? Uh, am I audible and visible? Yes, perfectly audible and So, uh, can I get started? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, just a second. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, and good afternoon to all. So, my topic for the presentations here is a multi-country comparisons of cryptocurrency versus gold and portfolio optimizations through generalized simulated annealing. And uh, with this, uh, I am the first author, and my co-author is uh, Ankit Song. Of my task of um, I think PPT is not, I'm sorry, PPT is not moving. Let me check. Yeah. So uh, this is the structure of the paper. Uh, first, we'll discuss about the introductions, then talk about data set of uh, briefly about methodology analysis, and then we'll move to that. So introductions. So cryptocurrency is an exciting development uh, in ever-evolving financial market. Everybody would have heard of it. And, but 
way back in 1999, Milton Friedman, uh, Nobel laureate, uh, actually thought so. And he told that internet would facilitate digital fund transfer money uh, without revealing and the participants of the transactions, reducing the role of played by the government and other agencies. And that was uh, basically became a reality uh, by the when the Bitcoin actually was introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008. Since then, the popularity of cryptocurrencies has risen sharply. Presently, there exists, if I am not wrong, at least more than 2,000 differently actively traded cryptocurrency in circulations with Bitcoin, um, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Binance Coin, Tether, Litecoin, Dogecoin, and also stable coin. The motivations behind this paper uh, we'll discuss over here. When the global financial crisis and European trade crisis happened, investors chose gold as the safe haven to diversify their portfolio. The growth of internet for the development and various virtual currencies as an alternative for further investment. And in the last 30 years from 1990 to 2020, the price of gold has increased by around 360%. While at the same period, Dojon industrial average grain around 991%. So over the long term, stock seems to outperform gold by about 3 to 1 ratio, but over short term horizon, gold may have gone up. Bitcoin, while Bitcoin has soared around 220% during 2020 itself. 13 years since inception, Bitcoin price has climbed from 0.08 US dollar to almost more than 38,000 US dollar. And gold, the closest comp uh, comparisons with other cryptocurrencies, has risen only 627% over the last 100 years. And in recent times, cryptocurrencies have failed as a new gold, uh, not only the Bitcoin, other currency, and large institutional investors like PayPal, Alphabet, they have actually included uh, Bitcoin and other some of the other cryptocurrencies in their portfolio. And uh, it has also become the official currency of country like El, El Salvador and with some of the countries considering it. So it is extremely important for the retail investors to stay updated with the recent developments in the financial world and how it might happen. Here in this paper, uh, what we are looking at is to compare gold and cryptocurrencies from a pure price perspective without considering the possible skewed individual investment attitudes across different countries. While most countries show negative attitude towards cryptocurrencies, it is legal in countries, at least legal to trade or invest in countries like France, Russia, Canada, and many other countries, nations over here. And the attractiveness of these currencies lies in the fact that they are decentralized mode of exchange, maintaining pseudonymity uh, of transactors along with high security architectures. However, winged to its lack of super supervisions and limited supply fixed at 21 million for Bitcoin, it shows highly bubble-like, highly volatile, but bubble-like price movement as such, and is considered a speculative asset at present. And even you can look at this graph also how the price have changed over the years. But at the bottom one, where, the, where it shows the volume, and we can see that the price may look volatile, but the volume has substantially increased from the beginning. Here, uh, the idea of Bitcoin as a possible replacement of gold continues to be source of much debate. And in this graph, actually, we have... Uh, documented the daily returns of gold and uh, Bitcoin. The more uh, deep colored one is the gold and the light one is the Bitcoin. And generally to quantify the volatility instead of standard deviations, the measure of value at risk is actually much more useful. And we do, we actually use that in this paper, but that also much in detail, which we'll talk about. And with the background in place, we turn into the core of the paper. 
And in our paper, the aim is to fold. Firstly, we try to quantify the value at risk of popular cryptocurrencies, and then we choose the one with the lowest R. And we use the cryptocurrency to compare with gold using portfolio analysis for 10 countries across the world. Here, uh, uh, for now, we actually, uh, we have taken the four top cryptocurrencies, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, similarly, Dogecoin and uh, the Litecoin. Although we have looked into other cryptocurrencies also, but there were some issues uh, for, uh, for us to get the data and uh, for some currencies, the data was not fully available. And we did not consider the stable coins because as we are trying to make it look into the VAR, so it, uh, it doesn't fit into our objective as it is already a stable uh, coin. And for portfolio analysis, we uh, actually look, get into the G20 countries. From the G20 countries, we take the top 10 countries, uh, which has actually uh, mined more of cryptocurrencies in the world. And we also consider their, uh, their indices as the, the stock indices as the benchmark for making comparisons. And we consider the risk free rate um, as their government securities, 10 years government securities yield as the risk free rate. All the data are collected from different websites and uh, the like Yahoo Finance and there are other websites which is available uh, uh, can actually give us the data for the cryptocurrencies. And the stock prices data are calculated from, uh, taken from Yahoo Finance and government yield is collected from national banks website uh, for the different countries. Now, uh, coming to the methodology for calculating VAR, we uh, basically, we have the first objective is to find the value at risk for four cryptocurrencies. Now, VAR is a measurement of a risk exposure. It quantifies probable depletions in the valuations of a risky assets or a portfolio given for a given confidence level for a, for a predefined period. And it focuses on tail end events of any distributions underlining the downside risk or the potential losses. Fundamentally, there are three different procedures for calculating VAR. Generally, the, the mainly used in academic paper is the historical simulations and the Monte Carlo simulations. Historical simulation is nothing. It is just that we take the daily returns and uh, then we uh, basically uh, or uh, we arrange it in terms of ascending order, and then we take the calculate the bar from the fifth percentile based on the fifth percentile or one percentile or ten percentile based on our choice. But there are also different variations within that because this way of calculating it considers all the returns we give actually the same weightage. But there are modified versions also like BRW, Budok, Richardson's White Law, where they give ex exponential weightage to more recent events and hence gives more accurate results. Another method, which is at the third point, is Monte Carlo simulations, where we take the, uh, from the historical data, we take the mean and standard deviations. And using that, we actually create random numbers to to get a simulated price series. And using that price series, um, based on algorithm produces different random numbers, we obtain formula for calculating VAR without any closed analytical form. But the one which is important for this paper is the parametric distributions. And that is what not been used in uh, many papers in the financial literature and also not in used in the context of gold or uh, cryptocurrencies. And this measure is to fit a parametric distributions to the empirical data and estimate work from the moments of the distribution. And these people highlight this portion since we feel studying cryptocurrencies in the future, knowing its distributions is going to be a vital importance. We firstly perform a Taki Lamba test actually um, to check for the conformity of the empirical data to specify theoretical distributions. And we, then we accordingly compare several distributions. We start, we run various distributions. We start with normal, hyperbolic, second, Laplace, Johnson, Sue, Kochi, and many others, um, many others presented in the main papers. And uh, we found that, uh, we noticed that Johnson's distributions approximates the empirical data in the best manner. 
and then we come to our second objective in that objective we uh, we take the cryptocurrency which has the lowest bar uh, and then we also consider the gold and considering cryptocurrency and gold along with for all these 10 different countries we make different portfolios along with their some stock uh, the largest stocks for for this paper we have considered the largest post stocks as per the market capitalizations for each country so first portfolio will have four largest companies and the cryptocurrency which has the lowest volatility as per the bar second one with largest companies and gold third one is largest companies with cryptocurrency and gold together and uh, here uh, we try to basically have our objective finance minimizing the bar and uh, this method is a little better than the market wise optimizations where one has to maximize returns along with minimizing risk or standard deviations but this model is too unsophisticated to represent the real world scenario with stricter constraints firstly better quantile based risk measure can can be uh, can be value at risk additionally liquidity constraints box constraints transactions cost constraints or even some additional constraints can be added over here which will add more depth into the problem and given the non linearity of the optimizations problem as the optimizations problems with lot of constraints going to be non linear and along with noisy data and additional constraints given by uh, us this paper employs generalized simulated handling approach uh, with value at risk objective for the portfolio constructions and we'll try to look at maximize this risk adjusted return measures and what are the risk adjusted return measures we consider here is the modified sharp ratio sortino ratio which are uh, previously also used and a new one which is recently became quite famous is the informations ratio informations ratio is uh, basically defined as the excess returns of assets over the benchmark returns divided by some sort of a tracking mean um now coming to the optimizations methodology we use the generalized simulated analytic technique the name of this algorithm comes from analytic metallurgy a technique involving heating and control cooling of material to increase the size of its crystal and reduce their defects so that concepts actually we brought it over here and the advantage of that concept is that uh, we can whenever we are trying to do this optimizations with lot of constraints and also noisy data non linear data uh, we get actually the best results and uh, for the value th these are the basically uh, the different distributions how they are fitting into it um, it uh, may not be visible for everyone i have to zoom uh, zoom out but here what we found is that johnson and so cdf actually is the best fit model over here and uh, there are diff different we do it on for all the cryptocurrencies to four different cryptocurrencies we have done yeah now uh, in this sections we present the value at risk analysis here is the empirical data for bitcoin fitted into the previously this discussed distributions and diagrammically uh, we have shown all the different distributions so what we have observed here is that the bitcoin has the least bar for all way for all possible ways and this was kind of expected given its most popular bitcoin most popular cryptocurrencies with having the largest market cap and also the most mature given its age compared with other currencies however with more and more upcoming cryptos and energy concerns regarding the bitcoin future analysis will probably show a different outcome if we have more number of years as the data then uh, we get into the portfolio analysis first uh, just this is just for the presentation so i will try to reading sir in 2 minutes i left 2 minutes right okay. yeah okay i just try to sum it up so here is the heat map basically where we show that the, there is not much of correlations between gold and bitcoin at least uh, in the during the normal period which suggests that that gold and bitcoin can be used in a portfolio together and these are the sharp ratio and the sortino ratios and um, the green actually is the best one and the yellow is the best one uh, the second best and the red is the third one and for the different countries 
and this is for the portfolio three equity gold and the bitcoin then we have equity uh, yeah one sec yeah, so ppt is i will not know Okay, so I am not going to spend uh, much time on the table, but I will just directly come to the conclusions um, due to the time constraint. So the, what we find is that, to summarize our analysis, in the value at risk measurement, we saw that being negatively skewed cryptocurrencies were best approximated by heavy tail distributions, but not as extreme as Posse distributions. And it is somewhere between Posse and Lapway, so distributions like Johnson's is the best approximation for it. So this is our first takeaway from the conclusion. Secondly, the Bitcoin is indeed one of the lowest bar under all different methodologies undertaken in the paper. And also for the portfolio analysis for six countries, we found portfolio three, which consists gold and Bitcoin together uh, perform the best. Whereas uh, portfolio one, which has considered only the crypto Bitcoin uh, is uh, actually working for the four countries. And despite high volatility, the it shows the importance of Bitcoin despite high volatility. And so it suggests that the cryptocurrencies or specifically the Bitcoin, have, which has the lowest worth, should be included in any retail investor's portfolio as it gives really high returns, even if the portfolio weightage for the cryptocurrency or the Bitcoin is very low. And another surprising finding is evident from the proportions of the respective assets in the optimized portfolio. In portfolio three, we find that gold takes a huge proportions neg negating the small proportions of Bitcoin and other equities. And this shows also the importance of the gold. So the main key takeaway from our paper is that while most other papers put forward either Bitcoin or gold, but while we conclude that the, for the retail investors, both should be included in the portfolio because both complement each other. And uh, there are, we have given some reasons uh, why, uh, what is the, why the gold price actually fluctuate, why Bitcoin can serve uh, along with gold, uh, Bitcoin can serve a better asset also in the uh, portfolio. And there are some future, uh, future prospect through which this similar, this sort of studies can be extended further. Okay, I stop here, yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful presentation. Now I request sir to give us some presentation. Uh, I'm ready to uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Patraji, uh, for a lovely presentation. Uh, firstly, I would like to congratulate you and your co uh, for uh, this enlightening work. Uh, coming to some quick comments uh, uh, from my side. Uh, first is uh, uh, your paper has been very well structured and very detailed. Uh, the literature review has been very exhausting. Given the data methodology uh, has been adequately described in the paper. Uh, data period, selection of sample, everything has been clearly explained. Uh, even the research methodology has been finally find uh, elaborated in the paper. And the subject, uh, no doubt, uh, stands very important in the current context because of uh, uh, the increasing market size, uh, the increasing penetration uh, of the cryptocurrencies, and also the evolving landscape of cryptocurrencies uh, as an asset class. Uh, one or two things, uh, uh, which I could observe is that the uh, paper uh, does not have sufficient discussions on regulatory aspects uh, of cryptocurrencies. Uh, maybe a comparison on uh, what is the regulatory take uh, across different different countries, whether it is central banks, uh, whether it is securities market regulators, are cryptos legally accepted as a kind of currency, or are cryptos recognized as an asset class? Uh, different countries have different uh, positions as on date. And how it may affect the, uh, the acceptability of this asset class, and how it may affect the viability of this asset class in a global portfolio. So, that part, I found it to be missing uh, the papers, maybe that can be a further scope of study. Uh, a quick comparison, because you are comparing 10 different countries in the paper. And of 
obviously all these trends and countries have different take when it comes to accessibility of cryptocurrencies. Coming to the portfolios which you are used to uh, maybe come to your findings, uh, I have one uh, very uh, quick question. Uh, you are used to uh, large four companies in each of these 10 countries. So is there a particular reason to use only large four companies in your equity portfolio? Why not an index like, for example, why not Nifty in India or why not an SP in the US? Because a portfolio which is having only large four companies in the equity, sometimes it, tend to, it can be a very concentrated portfolio. And uh, because the portfolio is very concentrated, your findings will get significantly influenced by the things of that. So maybe if you can, would like to respond to what thought process behind why you used only the large four companies in the equity. Yeah, uh, should I respond? Yes, you can respond. Now. Yeah, the first point is about the regulatory thing. Actually, that's a very good point about the regulatory thing. And uh, very frankly, it can be easily incorporated in the paper also. Because uh, while I uh, talked about the portfolio optimizations, we have different constraints, right? Where we can actually add a little bit more into the transactions cost. And like India has given 30% taxes, right? So uh, even for equity or something, we can add also 10% uh, the tax, 10 or 15%. So actually we have added that, but not we have not considered the recent, uh, India have recently uh, talked about 30% taxes, but previously like on an average, we have uh, basically looked into what is the uh, tax rate and that actually we have added into the uh, model for the transactions cost, but we have not done separately um, uh, separate values for all the separate countries, so, but it can be done. And as you suggested, a small discussions on the uh, one or two paragraphs about the regulatory methods uh, uh, can impact the results. Also, can be easily brought into the paper. And I, I really uh, thank you for that comment. Okay. And the second thing is that why we have considered the four um, um, uh, four uh, um, the, the stocks, the the highest market cap, is that of course we cannot actually take the index over here, although many other papers which working on guards and all those things, we will take the index, that's an easy way out basically. And here we have used the index as the benchmark. So uh, we are trying to see if we are really able to beat the benchmark or not. So we have to take individual stock. Now, either we take four or we take five or we take 10, that is depends on us, but definitely to be very frank, even if we take 10, somebody will ask me, why not next 20, okay. So that is always can be extended and, uh, but we have taken the four for the representation part. There is small number of portfolio tends to be concentrated. Uh, but we can, that can be basically uh, well, eight like, to ten. In today's times, uh, one can buy an ETF, uh, that's the simplest way of holding an index. And uh, basically you are comparing whether holding equity alone or whether holding equity along with gold or along with Bitcoin or along with both of them. Which one is better? So even if your benchmark is index, you can still have your equity representation to an index only. You can just spend some thoughts on that. Uh, yes, but definitely. definitely. Uh, four is a very concentrated. Uh, no portfolio manager will have only four stocks uh, in a portfolio. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, again related to the portfolio construction. Uh, you have not included any other asset class in the portfolio. The most important that one very big asset class which seems to be missing in my opinion is fixed asset. So your portfolio. No, we we have uh, we have actually taken that uh, also considerations because um, see we have taken the bond yield, the government bond yield because that also we need to see how our asset is actually uh, on an above our returns are on an above of that also. We have considered the bond yield of every country. No, but in your portfolio there is no uh, allocation to a bond or a big corporate bond, big government bond, or big, an index representing bonds of multiple countries. There is no allocation at all. Yeah, no, that is not. There is no allocations, but that can be uh, easily uh, incorporated in the uh, optimizations. That is possible. Because uh, a diversified portfolio manager or portfolio holder will have at least some allocation to fixed asset as well. Uh, as far as commodity allocation is concerned, you are adding gold, you are not adding other commodities. But uh, at least bond has, uh, and your findings might change once you add bonds in your portfolio. So, a portfolio which is a mix of bonds and equities, uh, adding a crypto to that and adding a crypto to only equity portfolio, your findings might change. And that gives you another 
uh, further scope of uh, expanding the study. Yeah, thank you for the comment. We will look into that. Uh, another thing is that the paper is silent on what are the weightages of crypto in your portfolio uh, uh, two and portfolio three, if I remember the portfolio number correctly. There are two portfolios which have a bit Bitcoin. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a very good thing. Actually, even we would love to give that. Uh, but actually, if the paper size has increased so much, it went even to 20,000 uh, words basically. So that's why we had cut down everything. But we do have all the tables. Because weightage of your portfolio going to crypto becomes very important for a portfolio manager. Because crypto obviously is a very volatile asset. If 50% yes, yes, yes. money is in crypto, then I'm sitting on a very volatile portfolio. But if, if only 2% of my money is in crypto, then I can still manage that volatility. So how much weightage? And actually, we have kept that uh, under the constraint of optimization that crypto allocation should not go beyond uh, 5%. So then constraint is, I am not sure whether it is clearly mentioned in the paper. Uh, yeah, it may not be. Any, I think that that is also a good point. We should clearly. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So five percent still looks a reasonably uh, good number. If you have more concentration towards crypto, then overall portfolio becomes volatile in the process. Exactly, definitely. That's why we have put in very strict constraints. But we should mention that in the paper, right? So how much is the constraint you are working with, and in the portfolios which you are creating for uh, comparing these three strategies, how much is the weightage of each of these asset classes, especially how much is the weightage of crypto, if that can be explicitly mentioned in the paper, that, that gives further uh, clarity to the reader. Okay, somebody is suggesting that including crypto is better, but how much percentage? Is it 2%? Is it 20%? Is it 50%? So that number also that can be explicitly mentioned. Uh, I just uh, like closing with my last uh, maybe key question. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the implications of this research? Who can be the uh, who can use this finding, who can get benefited from this finding, and how they can get benefited. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, there are two, three contributions of the work. Okay. Uh, as, uh, like, as you rightly told that we should also know the weightage of that. And we kept that in mind, keeping that Indian mentality that the weightage should not go. Uh, so, we actually wanted to tell in this paper, first thing is that, okay, the retail investor can, should, can also invest in crypto within a certain limit. Okay. So, um, we should not actually leave that um, um, totally. The second thing is that uh, the many of most of the papers actually look, look into the mainly volatility of the this using Archgarch model and either they look into gold or crypto, they try to choose one of them. Okay, But we try to show that, okay, a portfolio can still perform better despite you have a limited uh, exposure to crypto. Yeah, and you can actually have exposure to equity plus gold and plus crypto still you can actually perform better so that is one of the things and the main thing also as i told that uh, this methodology different type of is actually not been used in finance field much okay and we see there is a lot of scope uh, to be used and not only for the cryptocurrencies paper but for various other papers whereas portfolio optimizations can come into play Okay, so that way also we have a some sort of academic. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Parshali. I once again congratulate you and your co author for this wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. Research. Uh, thank you and all the rest. Thank you, Ritesh, sir, for your valuable insights. Now I would like to throw open the uh, for question and answer for our audiences. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Parthaji, sir. All the best. Uh, now, moving on. Uh, Thanks, Thank you. Moving on, uh, the first paper presenters are back. Uh, the technical glitch has been solved. Now, again, I repeat the first paper. Uh, the title of the first paper is Integration between Emerging Market Equity and Global Markets. Is it fundamental or noisy? Evidence from wavelength peak noise volatility is below what analysis the time and frequency program. Now request the predictors to share their screen. Yeah. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay, good up, good afternoon to one and all. And uh, thank you, Sebi and ISM.
conference committee giving this opportunity to a respected chair and uh, discussant. So let me start uh, my presentation. So my topic is integration between emerging market equity on global markets. Is it fundamental or naive? Evidence from Wavelet denoised volatility spillover analysis in time and frequency domain. So this will be my flow presentation, structure of presentation, starting with the conceptual work, followed by motivation, literature, objective of the study, data, methodology, finally empirical analysis and discussion of the result and conclusion and recommendation, empirical, uh, sorry, con conclusion and implication of the study. So why the image, the conceptual framework, starting with the conceptual framework, uh, emerging market is defined uh, in terms of the openness, how the market or economy is open to the outside world, though the degree of openness varies across the countries. So based on that, that is the basic criteria defining emerging market. And uh, even if the openness remains the same, but opportunity this varies uh, countries to country. So this is how emerging market is defined. Now, why our focus is on emerging market? Because these are the four points we have found because 80% of the global economic growth comes from emerging market and developing economies. And why, why this market is so attractive to the investors because of lower inflation, lower public debt as a percentage of GDP. And uh, now uh, emerging market uh, emerges as a theme of investment uh, as a block, MSI block normally consists of 24 countries index. So that is the third motivation focusing on emerging market. Now, the classification criteria on which emerging market index is constructed, that is MSI emerging market, uh, size, liquidity, and market accessibility, that framework attracts different themes of investment into the emerging market. So these are the uh, points which motivates for this particular research relating to emerging market. Now, our focus here is the point integration. Integration means uh, here we are using the word integration, connectedness, and uh, the correlation across the market. So here, uh, why integration is important because there is no doubt that we are integrated to outside the world. You are living in a global village. It is due to the rapid development of information technology, application of trading systems in the financial market, with securitization, deregulation, globalization of global markets. These are the factors which uh, leads to integration across, across the market. Now, here, another point I'd like to focus is I forgot to mention here, uh, in the title of the topic, our focus is integration. Is it noisy or fundamental? What do you mean by noisy? Because our research contribution it was uh, in that direction. Noisy means in 1986, Black defines noise means which is not fundamental. So market reflects, market price reflects all types of information. So when you are studying the connectedness using any other methods, any different methods, so it is, we are considering the noise in addition to fundamentals. So we are trying to remove the noise here by using some econometric methodology, I'll discuss that, so that we can see what is the real integration, because the integration is important here, because uh, integration leads to uh, estimating the uh, optimal weight in the portfolio because that depends on the covariance matrix that comes from integration level of integration or connectedness. Again, uh, deciding on the portfolio diversification. These are the factors uh, 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 which normally based on the nature of integration. So integration we have estimated here uh, with raw data, you know, is different. So the flip side of the integration is the negative part of integration is when you are living in a global world. So spillover, volatility, you know, anything happens to one market, to another market. That spillover is there. That is the uh, negative part of integration. Then contagion. 
contagion means we may expose to emotional contagion uh, like or mentality if some uh, when there is no information trading happens in, in other markets just like today's market condition uh, we don't have any information fundamental but we are down by around 2% 3% in the market so that kind of things are there when you are connected so our focus here is here to measure the integration based on the kind of spillover ha happening across the market so we have found in the literature uh, the, uh, what kind of studies done so far so linkages between developed emerging developed equity markets are there how developed markets are connected between developed and emerging market we have found integration between regional levels australia asia latin america uae countries asian countries that kind of regional level integration also studies are there between markets and commodity markets between uh, equity market and exchange rate so all are there but how we are different are uh, we are considering both uh, emerging market as a block and individual emerging market how individual emerging market and individual uh, emerging markets as a block are related to global factors that through integration so global factors here we have taken uh this is the gap we have found I, uh, in the literature uh, emerging markets uh, as a block is uh, how it is connected to global factors like global factors we have taken us because it is found variation in most of the market depends on how us market is performing then oil and exchange rate so together we have taken three global factors oil exchange rate and us market emerging markets how as a block is related to these three factors how individually they are related so uh, so five emerging market we have selected based on the capitalization market capitalization of the respective markets and uh, third part we have found is uh, uh, there is no study in the frequency domain frequency means investors are coming to the market to for short term medium term and long term so how markets are connected in different time scale that is important for portfolio diversification risk management connected uh, across dip, uh, different frequencies then finally we have found there is no literature on whether what is the fundamental uh, connectedness happening across the market that means without noise that means if it is not noise that is temporary transitory factors so it will remain some time and over a period of time uh, uh, it will be adjusted in the market the market price will adjust the noise so why should i worry about the noise that is what the purpose so let us remove the noise and see the integration that was the gap we have found in the market so our objective is to based on the gap or to investigate the connectedness between emerging market as a block and top five emerging markets with us market because us market is important oil is important for emerging market and exchange rate uh we have measured the connectedness using the volatility spillover because that is when you are connected you are uh, uh the you are linked through the spillover will not be able to spillover is measured then to measure the connectedness so you can to investigate whether the connectedness is noisy or fundamental so data you have taken from bloomberg S&P 500 represents the US market MSCI emerging market index is taken as, uh, as a proxy for emerging market block Bloomberg dollar index is taken for market index is taken as a as a proxy for exchange rate and Brent crude oil taken as for the oil so this is the basic descriptive statistics uh, and you can, you can see the returns are positive after emerging market so five emerging markets are south africa uh, india uh, then taiwan and uh, korea south korea and shanghai composite index has been taken here so this is the basic statistics and we have done the stationary test before before analysis so all the series are stationary are in the in the difference from that means return is taken for the study and the correlation matrix that is the the problem is there due to 
चाइना All other market are highly correlated with all the all these three factors, and all the markets, as a block, as individual, at the individual level, they are negatively correlated to exchange rate. Now, coming to the methodology part, we have studied the spillover based on the Diamond-Ilmaz method, that is based on Bhar, because the beauty of the Bhar is you can take both endos, uh, endogenous and exogenous variable together to study as a system. That means all the markets, U.S. emerging. crude and exchange rate we can consider it as a system because they are jointly functioning and uh, we are measuring the connectedness uh, exist among those uh, uh, markets so spillover is measured at the total level total level means uh, what is the to uh, uh, total level uh, uh, will can quantify the size of the connectedness exists uh, between the market Between those markets, and uh, directional spillover is measured. That means uh, from one market to another market. That means how much spillover coming from X to Y, and how much spillover coming to X from other market. That is directional. And finally, we have measured the net directional connectedness. That means net means how much volatility one market spills over to other. How much volatility same market is getting from other. the difference between this will uh, determine the net position of that market in the system so i am going to discuss the table i hope the table is visible so i am going to discuss three things here to the so methodology uh, you can see here the uh, numbers marked in green that is the total spill over value that is 54.12 that is with the raw data 54.12 is the size of connected that means it says the connected variation in the market of those market here 54 54% variation is coming from the connectedness now if i remove the error that is presented in the panel b after removing the error see the connectedness increases to 61 marked in green that means uh, uh, the Or, uh, because of the presence of error, the connectedness, connectedness is understated. So it will impact when con when you are con considering the kind of connectedness exists within the market. If it is understated, it will impact your post portfolio construction and risk management activities. So that is what the point importance of noise here. So if I discuss the next important thing about this table is the. uh uh if you look at the net position that means what is the role of the individual market in that this particular system uh, the net row that net row of the two then finally net last row of the table you can see the signs look at the signs if the, if it is negative means it is the net receiver of volatility from this system if it is positive means it is the net spill over that means it is transmitting this to the system now if you compare raw, uh, the net position with, as per the raw data and net position as per the after removing the noise you can see there is no change in sign that means uh, uh, whether the market as a transmitter or receiver of volatility noise does not impact that that means uh, it does not impact the structure it impacts the magnitude that is what we have found uh, uh, in this particular context then if you look at the diagonal figures here from cospi to cospi taiwan to taiwan that represents the diagonal figures represents the volatility coming from the own market that means uh, if you look at the cospi it is 33.49 that means uh, variation in cospi is around 33% coming from its own variation and it is affected by 54% is affected by this connectedness 
So if you look at the diagonal figures, it is overstated. That means uh, if you don't consider the news, or uh, sorry, if you don't consider the noise, you go with the raw data, you are overestimating the own volatility. And if you look at, after removing the noise in the diagonal figures, the, the volatility spilling over from its own market is lesser than the volatility at, before removing the noise. That is another thing. Then if you look at uh, the uh, spillover from the three factors, SPX, that is uh, US, Brent, and dollar, to this individual emerging market and emerging market as a block. And I'm sorry. Uh, so so the you know, spill over coming from the US and market is understated. So you can tell me if you could wrap up in uh, two minutes. Okay, okay. Thank you for reminding me. So it is SPXL, that means uh, if you don't remove the noise, you are underestimating the volatility or the shock coming from the US market. If you compare here, the column SPX, before removal, after removal, it is understated. Likewise, if you look at the brand code, it is more or less same. That means uh, noise does not impact the uh, risk coming from the brand. But if you look at the dollar index, it is understated, but the uh, the size or magnitude may be less, but it is understated. So what we have seen is uh, the noise impacts the magnitude, but not the structure. Now coming to the, because of constant of time skipping this, so what we found is uh, system-wide spillover. That means uh, the uh, systemic connectedness is understated due to noise and what we found is emerging market as a block. Uh, found to be net transmitter. That means that is uh, actually in contrast to what we normally uh, we have perception about emerging market. It is a net transmitter of volatility to this system. And receiver only the receiver of volatility from the US market. For brain and dollar index, it is a net transmitter. And presence of noise impacts the magnitude, but not the structure, means the net position is not changed. And one of the important aspects of finding that spillover of volatility cluster, that means just like volatility clusters, uh, that is one of the important stylized facts of volatility. Here, the uh, spillover of volatility cluster du uh, during uh, crisis period, just like volatility cluster in crisis period, what we have found is spillover of volatility clusters in the crisis period. So what is the policy implication in short run that uh, I could not discuss the short run part. Uh, actually in the short run, uh, uh, the market is, uh, the integration level is lesser than the integration, integration level in the long run. So in the short run, there is a possibility of, uh, 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 what you can say, a possibility of constructing a portfolio, taking those market together. And uh, in the short run also, uh, uh, it is found that it is uh, more noisier than in the long run. That means uh, the implication of this part is short run normally, uh, the market is impacted by transitory factors. In the long run, it is more impacted by the fundamental. That's why we are finding the spillover in short run, it is more noisier than the spillover in the long run. And implication for the risk and portfolio managers to revisit their, uh, the hedging and portfolio investment program respectively. And uh, they, they should consider, that is one of our suggestion, to the noise part of the data. So after removing the noise, they may re-estimate their uh, optimal weight in the portfolio or the hedging ratio. So I think that uh, will give them an, uh, a reasonable weighting uh, or optimal weighting value and the hedging ratio for the investors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shuru, for such a amazing presentation. Now I request the chief to give his
situations. Thank you, Ripu. Uh, thank you, Professor Jena, for uh, such a uh, enlightening presentation and such a uh, enlightening uh, research. Uh, firstly, uh, some quick comments. Uh, uh, I found the research paper to be very enlightening and very informative. Uh, the literature review part uh, was very extensive. Uh, we made references to many of the relevant literatures uh, which uh, have researched uh, uh, on volatility spectrum and also the impact of life. Uh, even the data and research methodology part was very adequately explained. Uh, on the findings front, uh, the paper not only understands volatility spillover, but it also evaluates how the spillover changes during the times of crisis and during normal times, and also how it changes uh, during various frequency domains. Uh, one enlightening part of, the, of your findings, uh, which I would just like to mention, is uh, uh, based on your uh, research, uh, you have concluded that. Uh, uh, this volatility spillover is more mutual uh, rather than the existing popularity and existing finding of literature that is uh, a directional spillover. Uh, I also have some uh, small uh, uh, questions uh, to understand a bit better for you. Uh, like to begin with question one uh, is uh, you have included three different proxies uh, as proxy of global factors uh, for understanding the volatility spillover. Uh, which are US SP 500, uh, US dollar index, and uh, Brent crude. Uh, I just would like to understand any particular reasons for including Brent crude oil as well uh, as one of the proxy for global factors. So, uh, as far as crude is concerned, normally it is found that emerging markets are the net importers of crude oil. Any variation to the crude oil, it poses a kind of risk to the emerging markets and uh, immediately. It reflects in the US, uh, in the, sorry, equity market. So uh, just like the current scenario, it uh, crude oil uh, moved from around 80 level to 100 level. So market is reacting negatively. And in most of the literatures, we have found that emerging markets are highly correlated, correlated to this uh, oil market, particularly in the context of emerging. That's why we have considered that. Okay. Uh, maybe another related question to this, uh... Uh, different countries may have different level of dependencies on uh, brand crude. While uh, a large portion of some of the markets you have studied, they are uh, crude oil importers or crude oil consumers, they are net importers. But if there's a country which is a net exporter, uh, which is rather a crude oil producer and not a consumer, uh, will, uh, or, uh, have you done any study or any analysis in terms of whether or not it's been over on account of brand crude prices? Is it different for us? Uh, Oil consumer, we have the oil producer patients. Yes, actually, uh, that definitely impact will be different because when oil price increases, it's positive for the oil producing countries, but that part we have not considered. Our objective is to see what are the risk factors and how emerging markets at their individual level and as a block, they are connected. That's why we have not differentiated, we have not differentiated between consuming and uh, producing countries. So our focus was just emerging market in general. Okay, okay. And another thing is you have chosen a sample of uh, five countries for your study, top five countries you have selected based on the market cap. Uh, but have you done any uh, competitive analysis in terms of what are the foreign capital inflows or foreign investment inflows each of these countries are getting? And does the spillover vary uh, depending upon uh, whether the country is heavily dependent on foreign investment because whether the company is uh, rather more dependent on domestic investment. So have you done any kind of comparative analysis between this? Yes, uh, that's a very good point actually I have raised, but to, we, we have not uh, uh, looked into that, but in terms of foreign inflows also definitely markets uh, normally places in different, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, uh, different ranks they will get. Uh, so we have not considered that part actually. Basically, we have gone by the capitalization. As you said, that might be another direction we, we can see whether the countries receiving higher amount of foreign portfolio investment might be more exposed to global factors. Yes, you are right. And that fact, and the study can be extended in that direction. Okay. And uh, what is your opinion on the implications of this study or the end users of this study? 
especially uh, obviously uh, portfolio managers or investors are definitely going to benefit. So maybe as part of the response, if you can quickly uh, comment how investors can get, get benefited from this study, and do you pursue any other stakeholders who might get, get benefited from this uh, findings? Yeah, our study focus is about the noise. So what we have found in the literature is noise impacts the volatility uh, because it deviates, uh, it takes the price away from the fundamentals. So that creates volatility and the volatility impacts uh, through covariance matrix impacts the level of connectedness. If level of connectedness is impacted, it will impact your hedge ratio, your optimal weight in the portfolio. That's why we thought, let us see uh, how removing the noise can we get uh, a set of portfolio, uh, set of stocks or set of asset in the portfolio, which is optimal? That means, it, is it more optimal? But that part of the studies we have not done. And that is a suggestion for the future study by removing the noise, what is the optimal weight or hedge ratio you are getting? That, that is a different part of the study that we have not done. But here we are, what we have observed is noise impacts the integration. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dina. Uh, I once again congratulate you and your co authors for producing such a fine piece of work. Thank you very much, sir. It was a pleasure uh, learning from your work and listening to you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your insightful comments. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, I have some clarification with regard to the paper. Uh, you have taken emerging market as a block. Can we understand the, uh, the results in terms of emerging markets as a block or individual emerging market? Whether all emerging markets be in the same manner? The other thing is, you uh, told that uh, there is a mutual uh, transmission. That is, mutual transmission between developed. And the emerging market or among the emerging markets also. And if that is the case, whether the, the integration is similar or different. And uh, another is uh, one, one more observation is uh, in short term, the noise is more, and in long term, the noise uh, stabilizes and the, and the integration is. But what is the short term, and when we are taking a time domain? Uh, what is the short term and when, you know, how long do you wait that the uh, noise uh, stabilizes and uh, the integration is fundamental? Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, as far as first question is concerned, how emerging market is a block and emerging market at the individual level, uh, how they are different as far as connectedness is concerned. Yes, so we have uh, seen uh, different level of connectedness uh, exists at the individual level and at the, uh, the emerging market as a block because uh, when you combine you know taking emerging market as a block the idiosyncratic risk or country specific risk is averaged out so definitely we are getting a different impact from the global factors for the emerging market as a block and we are getting a mixed uh, bag of responses for the individual emerging markets. So yes, it is different. And the, the second part of the first question is with regard to how emerging market themselves are related, but that is not the focus of our study. Our focus is how emerging market are related to global factors as a block, <coughs> as an individual level. So we have not studied that part, but it is there. Uh, in the table, but we are not analyzing that part. And as far as the time period is concerned, the short term is one to two days. It is uh, normally based on the data, manually have not taken. But uh, since we have daily data, our short run and long run, it is in number of days. So it is one to two days in the short run. And long run, we are getting a 15 because that is what we are getting uh, out of the data. Since it is daily data, we are getting long term means it is more than 15 days. And in short term, it is one to two days. Thank you for your response. Uh, moving on, 
The third paper is going to be presented in physical mode at NISM, and the title is Organization Capital and Form Life Cycle Family and Non Family Forms. We have with us the author, Ms. Akansha Saxena from IBS Hyderabad. With the permission of Chair, I request presenter of the third paper, please proceed. Hello everyone, good afternoon. My name is Akansha Saxena and uh, I have recently completed my PhD last year and then I joined as assistant professor in IPS Hyderabad. The topic that I'm going to present today is, uh, it, it's a paper that we had working on and uh, it's titled as Does Organization Capital Determine Firm Life Cycle Stages? So we were having uh, talks on sustainability, we were discussing that how it is very really important for firms to be sustainable, for, for having a sustainable environment for all of us. And uh, for organizations, uh, one way to be sustainable would be to invest in organization capital. Organization capital is a capital that is very really specific to that organization itself. The, the culture, the policies, or the processes that are very form specific in nature. So that is our definition in simple terms about organization capital. So this should be the flow of my presentation. We will introduce the topics that is from life cycle, organization capital. Then we'll discuss the research objectives, hypothesis, discuss the sample and data. Then we'll discuss the model that, that we have run and then we will conclude with our results and the limitations that our media school for the future studies. So, uh, as uh, we are mentioning, uh, organization capital is a firm specific knowledge and capabilities which differentiate a firm from the another firm. So, it's basically how you gain sustainable advantage in terms of uh, being competitive and being different to the other organization. It is considered as a mother of intangible essence. So you have tangible essence like property, plan, machinery, and then you have some invisible essence. So organization capital is that kind of invisible, intangible asset for a firm. This invisible asset remains in the organization and it forms the basis of competitive advantage. And there have been studies which say that it impacts firm performance positively. And there have been studies which say that it, it also helps them to have a competitive, sustainable advantage. Now, in the literature, measuring this organization capital has been a quest. Like, uh, there have been different definitions as how you would define organization capital and rather how you would calculate organization capital. So, uh, there are broadly two theories that now emerge out of this. Uh, there is one theory which says, that organization capital is inbuilt in the human resource of the organization. So what that theory says is that as the human capital or as a particular employee moves from this organization, the organization capital does not remain in that organization. But the other view says that it is imbibed in the organization itself, its culture, its processes, and even if the employee moves from the organization, the organization capital remains. So basically, these are the two broader views, and these are the two, you know, broader uh, ways to define organization capital. Uh, in the one way, when we are saying that it is based on human capital, we, we measure it based on compensation, employee training, and then the other way, the papers these days are measuring it based on selling and distribution, uh, general and administrative expenses. So these are the expenses that you have to put in and any cost that is involved in this should be captured as your organization capital. Now the other uh, other organization equation 
future that we are focusing here is sperm life cycle. So just as humans, sperms are also, you know, uh, they born, they grow, they mature, and then they eventually become. So that is their life cycle stage of a farm. And um, any change in the organization follows this pattern, like from one stage to another. Now, possible association of uh, organization capital and firm life cycle is based on a resource based theory. And what that theory says is that firm life cycle is driven by the accumulation of firm specific knowledge. So, firm specific knowledge would tell that this is the uh, uh, this will lead to the change in firm life cycle stages. Now, the organization capital acts as a source for the resources of the firm. And these resources are thus act as a foundation of firm life cycle stages. So this is how we say that organization capital would be different at different life cycle stages. And uh, this view, that resource-based theory, would, uh, would be based on the view that says that it is imbibed in the organization and it will not change if the employees move from the organization. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, we are also, we first test organization capital and firm life cycle and then we also test does this relationship is different between different categories of firm. Uh, in this paper, for this slide, we are showing family and non-family firms. However, we have done it for business groups, firms as well and other categories of firms, like small and big. And um, in India, we have a, a predominance of family firms. And uh, what happens is family firm that the control is very much in the, in the hands of the promoters. And there is not really a dilution of the ownership. And um, the literature, one literature suggests that these family firms should have more organization capital. And uh, that is what we want to check, that is there any difference between a family and non-family firm? Is there a presence of a family member as the owner? Would that really change your organization capital. So that is what we plan to test. So uh, Anderson and Reed say that the family firms have specialized knowledge leading to better firm performance than non-family firms. And uh, what happens is uh, we when we discuss the firm life cycle, when the firm is at very introduction stage or it is very new, family firms control uh, family controlled firms enjoy certain benefit of ownership concentration. And uh, that the knowledge that the owner has regarding the firm, that would be, you know, be able to introduce in such firms in the introduction stage. So that is why we, we assume that maybe in the introduction stage, the firms who are controlled by the family owners would have higher organization capital. So that is one argument. However, uh, we, I mean, we are keeping it open. It, it, we just want to test it with how it comes out to be. Uh, yeah, in contrast, it can also be argued that organization capital is such an important, uh, you can say, capital for both the categories of firms. So, either, either you are a part of family firm or you are not controlled by the family firm, it does not matter. Both the categories of firms would have to have higher organization capital at the different, different stages. So, those relationships, uh, sorry, before that, our research, uh, our research objectives are already clear. That is, we want to examine whether firms with high organization capital are likely to be in a particular life cycle stage, and also to investigate whether likelihood of a firm being in that stage depends upon OC, uh, the, uh, OC and that depends uh, changes with the firm categories or not. So these are our hypotheses. So, uh, what based on literature and based on theory, uh, what we argue and how we hypothesize is that organization capital will be maximum in introduction stage and the decline stage. Now, why at introduction stage for organization capital would be higher? Because firm is very new, it is introduced, it is now introducing itself in the market. And at this point of time, it will not have a lot of money to invest in the tangible assets. And not just that, it, it probably would like to establish itself first. It would like to establish its organization and form specific processes, and that is why the organization capital in such stage would be more. And similarly, when if you know when now it starts to grow and become mature, now it has educated 
and a modest knowledge about the market and it has a, a, a good amount of cash in hand and maybe at this time it would be able to invest in tangible assets and intangible assets from the introduction only will help the firm succeed so it is basically you know sustainability argument that we want that the in the initial stage the capital that you perform uh, that you hold will help you well as and when you grow and mature but then when it lands into uh, when, uh, bankruptcy or it starts declining then again it would have to invest more in organization capital so or it can it may not be able to invest in more in the organization capital so that is how we are saying that this is, could be the possible relationship and our h4 is based on family and non family firms and we we are arguing that it could be higher for family mm -hmm. firms and now this is our data we took data from progress iq database from the period 1999 to 2020 our firm year observation we started by but for more than one lakh and then our final sample after we looked at financial firms and government firms were having around 53000 firm year observation for around 3700 firm firms uh and this is our empirical model where uh, we basically apply a multinomial multinomial logistic regression because our dependent variable is categorical in nature with the one two three four for different life cycle stages here for xi is our other control variable uh, uh, other control variables and uh, that is what we want to check the impact of organization capital uh, organization capital on the probability of firm being in a particular life cycle stage so we measure organization capital and we follow espel and papa nicolo measure that is they calculate organization capital based on this perpetual inventory method that is for your zero and year it is your ratio of selling general and administrative expenses and then for every year you have a measure of organization capital you in this you also take into account the growth rate and also the depreciation of this intangible assets and then we calculate this measure so we calculated organization capital based on this measure we calculated firm life cycle based on dickinson's 2011 measure of life cycle and uh, what uh, the author says is that it is based on the cash flows of the firm that is operating investing and financing cash flows what their signs are will tell you in which life cycle stage the firm is in and for family and non family you are taking a uh, cut off of 50% and in in literature it is already 20% that we many studies are taking but in indian firm what we observe is that if we take this 20% more than 90% of our firms will then fall into a uh, family firm category so that is why the uh, we take 50% as our cut off criteria and these is our uh, variable definition for other control variables as well like firm size growth capital structure profitability market growth and other control variables are there coming to results uh, this is our descriptive statistics and um, uh, we observe here that yeah uh, for our introduction and decline stage we observe this organization capital uh to be more and then we found that for other stages it was less than the other stages it was the mean descriptive that we check here and this oc is uh if we then for the correlation matrix also we find positive oc with introduction and decline stage and negative with growth and maturity stage and then we also first did the mean different test and uh, hsd test and we observe that in the introduction stage you know it is more as compared to growth and maturity but again when the firms are declining to shake out and decline the it is it is higher so that is our observation when we did a mean difference test and we found out significant difference in organization capital of different stages of the firm then we this is our uh, regression results and here as well we find that for the likelihood of firm being in introduction and decline is positive and it is negative for growth and maturity stage uh similarly uh, and then we tested our family and non family group argument and 
but uh, to our surprise, we were thinking that maybe the family firms would have higher organization capital, but we did not find that. We find that it is same for family and non-family firms, the relationship. And then this basically motivated us and we further checked it uh, for business group and standalone firms. We found the similar results. We also checked it at different size results and then also we found a similar relationship. So uh, again, this is something that we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, sticking on later. And this is a summary of our results that uh, we have explained and this, what high and how we were hypothesizing. And uh, we conclude that our results reveal that evidence of relationship between OC and firms are at the stage. Firms with high OC are more likely to be in introduction stage since firms in their early initial stages are focused to build sustainable organization practice and culture. However, in advanced stages, uh, they are characterized with low organization capital as in these stages they, they focus more on physical. And then OC is the mother of intangible assets and this is very much evident when we check at different firm categories. Uh, we have future scopes and limitation like what we are next uh, going to check is transition of firm from one life cycle stage to another and is it helping the organization capital that it has built in the previous stage, in the subsequent stage, is it helping? Is there any improvement in its firm performance? So that is our future direction. And uh, it has, as of now, in Indian context, uh, this is the first study in organization capital and life cycle. A cross country analysis can be done. There is another study in US context. And uh, it can also be further checked based uh, on different robustness uh, tools we can apply. And this is how we conclude our research. So, first, you meet Sakanta. It's indeed a very enlightening study. Uh, and the findings are very enlightening in terms of how relationship capital is linked with the uh, uh, life cycle stage of different different forms, from the and from the and from the and from the and from Coming to the paper specifically. Yeah. Coming to the paper, uh, even most of the sessions were very uh, detailed and very uh, starting from the literature. Uh, the number of forms uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, some related to selection of sample and um, related to measurement of population capital. I'll start with measurement of population capital. So, you have used a uh, lag SGA scale by the PDE. So, SGA part. Has been explained to some extent in the paper. Uh, any reasons why it has been scaled by the uh, There are two ways you can scale. If you do it with PD, that's the uh, exact tangible essence. If you do it with total essence, then maybe some part of intangible essence is also coming in that picture. So that is why we take plant property and equipment. Scale that. Like, out of, like, how much is my intangible out of my intangible? So this is what we are trying to understand. Okay, got it. And uh, what about uh, clear intangibles? If someone is having clear intangibles, like the uh, or any other So that is what happens. So that becomes part of the uh, L total essence. So we checked both the ways, okay. and uh, we found that maybe if you present it with just TP, it would be much, uh, much, it would make much sense because we are only uh, measuring it with the total tangible essence. That is the idea. Okay. Uh, coming to selection of samples, I want to. First, uh, you have excluded uh, financial firms, uh, financial firms, but I think the reason for excluding financial firms has not been explicitly okay. discussed in the paper. So, if you can enlighten us. Sure, sir. So, in mostly corporate finance studies, we exclude government and financial firms because of how they are regulated. So, for that reason, we only focus on non financial and government firms because they have different regulations, and that's why to avoid the biasness in the results. We can deal with the number of observations. Okay. And uh, you have studied. We can do the similar study for financial statistics. And you have evaluated a sample of more than 3,700 plus uh, firms. But uh, all those firms have 
be evaluated at the same level. Uh, does it make sense to organize those songs based on the sectors they represent or maybe the business verticals they represent? Uh, because uh, uh, organizing capital in a fixed entity might be different from an organizing capital in a service entity, or uh, maybe organizing capital in a pharma business might be this is this is not going into machining, but for that we control industry levels. So okay. we control that based on taking the levels of each industry, and this is how we control industry pay. And we also control the time period frames because at different time it would be different. So it's gonna remain same. So for that we take those control. But okay. as you mentioned, sector was not listed as controlled very no, that sector would not be the uh, exactly listed, but you would see there would be firm FE, firm fixed rate. Okay. So what they control, so yes, they will control for them. Okay. And another thing is, uh, if you look at the new age tech companies, uh, they would need to spend a lot on innovation or research, or even companies from a particular kind of business, or the IT sector, or if I can take an example, that well, but it's a three-year-old company, but even today, they stop innovating and they lose their customers. So, those kind of firms might, I'm just raising an argument, those kind of firms might need to spend more on organized capital compared to other kind of firms. So, can we assume that findings will be not really depending on what kind of business they are actually, or should it really uh, because of the sector? Well, okay, to be better, to be valid, that the kind of business, uh, what you mentioned. Uh, one thing is that uh, we are controlling for that based, based on the, uh, you can say we broadly categorize them into industry and uh, But other than that, uh, I would say for farmers more innovating, uh, then it is also investing in organization capital itself, yeah, what you were also mentioned. So even if they are at the growth stage or maturity stage, they might invest more in organization capital. We also, to, and we also wanted to check that because there any change in the when it transitions from one stage to another. So when we probably see that, that if these are the ones that they are transitioning, how is their relationship is what you are going to check. The last thing, uh, what in your opinion are going to take implications for the new series of these? Yes. Who are the possible stakeholders who can get benefited from this and how? Broadly, if you categorize the implication, uh, one could be based on the literature because uh, as we mentioned, this is a new study, can be the first study in India, relationship of even the calculating uh, organization capital and it is co-authored by Professor Shamita Rao there, Shamita Rao there, and also with my guide, Professor Ranaji, sir. So this is our first study that we, we have conducted and uh, in the literature, it will have its implication. And in the market, I would say that uh, maybe the firms who are new, so they can uh, then plan their policies accordingly. They can also plan their infrastructure policies based on that, that. Do they want to hold their funds or not? Do they want to distribute their funds or not? Or if they want to invest in its organization capital company. So these could be a few policies and implications that I feel could happen. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you I for the lively presentation. I want to congratulate all the authors for there is one question from the internet from Viresh. Uh, back testing that if you are necessary proves your result. Back testing if you are mentioning uh, based on the transition of from if they have come back from or the growth stage to introduction is what we are gonna check. Uh, one thing we are assuming is that uh, you know uh, what sometimes what happens is that the firms are very introduction in, in, they are very new sometimes they land into the guys are very faster so their maybe the relationship would be different so they moving from one stage to the previous stage is also a possibility but we need to work on this transition phase as of now we have not done that. Yes, ma'am, please. One of the people you will have found that in the growth stage, size is negative. Uh, how do you explain? Because size 
is positive in all the stages. Side of the one. Maybe the impact of size. Yes, size is negative. The impact of size. Yes. How do you explain that size will be negative during the growth stage? Um, uh, it it's, it could not be a size map. I just yes, yes, you just see see the clear. Okay, this is the impact of size on the firm being in introduction stages. So size, because in the very introduction stage, the size would be smaller only. So yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. stage size is smaller. Right. Uh, it is in, uh, yeah. It is not. Uh, uh, it is not significant also, ma'am, in this stage. If we see the significance level okay. is not okay. but, but normally we understand that even to grow. Thank you. 
kind of try to attempt what are the uh, capital or national capital requirements from different side. So you have to see the supply side. In the supply side, also we look at like you know, when we think about providing platform for fundraising, we still look at the supply side. There also we see the stages of the farms. So in the initial stage, for example, it is the angel capital, then the next stage is your alternative investment funds like PE funds and the CF funds, then it's public capital. Then when the interaction point comes and the company starts uh, doing bad or they come to a stage where they have to restructure, again we have to go to the higher risk uh, capital pool like FDIs and AIFs. So if you can measure these two things, what is the demand side and what is the supply side? So that actually then you know that delivery part what I was talking about. That somehow answers the question. So these are some of my general observations and uh, congrats, I congratulate all the authors uh, for putting so much of effort and uh, writing these papers. But I believe that they will keep whatever little bit I said in mind, though I did say little bit I spoke quite about. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for enlightening with us with your wonderful remarks and sharing your thoughts with uh, all the presenters. I hope uh, I hope they will uh, they will take the input suggested by chair as well as discussing. Uh, now moving on, uh, it has been such a privilege to be a part of this wonderful session on behalf of SEBI and ISM. Let me first of all start by extending my heartfelt gratitude to our SEBI paper presenters, chairs, discussants, and all participants. I would also like to extend my sincere thanks to all attendees and participants, both online and offline, for making the time to be with us and be patient. Uh, now I request Dr. Ripali Dixit Ma'am to present a token of appreciation to our Honorable Chair, Dr. Prabhat Sir, and discussing Mr. Ritesh Nandwani. Thank you, Dr. Ripali. Thank you, thank you.